in one of my well, you know, one of my previous churches um, that I that I worked for, there was um, a, a good friend who I got to know, a guy uh, who was a dad of three girls. It's a thing, a dad of three girls, and he used to say he was used to um, whenever he got a phone call from one of them, and it started with this, Dad. Instantly he thought, instantly he thought, where are you? What time do I need to pick you up? And how much is this going to cost me? How much is this going to cost me? Uh, he loved his girls to bits, uh, but um, girls had grown up, and uh, one of his children, as they grew up, kind of walked away from the church, walked away from Christ, and um, got herself a respectable job alongside taking a lot of drugs. And she kept life um, kind of going for a while, but there was a point at which it all kind of um, came together and um, things completely collapsed for her. And she ended up in um, a bit of a mess. And, and, and the reality is for her to come back, it would take a miracle. But um, there's one thing you could say about this dad and her daughter. There is nothing you could do to stop him from helping her. He really did love and care for her, despite all the pain that she had put him through, and to the point where he would go and do things that actually she would not appreciate, but were good for her, like turning up and pouring out hundreds of pounds worth of alcohol down the sink. Why? Because the bond between a dad or a parent and their child goes very deep. It goes very deep. Now, I'm aware even talking like this, it might bring up some really painful emotions for some of us in this room. And uh, it may be that, you know, as we think about our relationship with a parent, um, it just hasn't been like that. But we kind of all know deep down what that should look like, uh, what that should feel like. That depth of emotion that I'm describing there is the kind of depth of emotion that we meet in this letter of 2 Corinthians uh, between Paul and this church because this church are his spiritual children. Um, just have a look at um, chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. Just have a look. He says to them this, um, second half, verse 14, after all, in fact, I'll read from the start of verse 14. Now I'm ready to visit you for the third time and I will not be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions, but you. He loves them. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So I'll very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? See here, Paul is expressing uh, just how much he loves this church. They really are his spiritual children. And, and he's saying, look, um, uh, because I'm your spiritual children, I haven't charged you for anything. Um, if you've been around over the past months as we've looked at 2 Corinthians, you will know some false teachers, the super apostles as they are known, have come into this church and have said, Paul doesn't really love you. You really shouldn't be listening to him. Don't ca he doesn't care for you. And one of the reasons they said he doesn't really care for you is because he hasn't charged you money. I mean, that sounds weird, doesn't it? He hasn't charged them for his preaching to them. They said, anyone who's worth listening to, you, they, they charge you money. And so we charge you money. And what he said, the reason why he hasn't charged them money is because he is like a dad with his kids. Now, look, I've just been thinking about this. And, you know, when I take, when I take my kids out to um, the swings at the local park, I'm not there pushing them thinking, that's another £12.50 on the tab. That's another £12.50. Christmas morning, they rush downstairs. They open the presents. Thanks, Mum and Dad. Oh, it's amazing. I'm thinking, it's another 40 quid. I'm going to add it to your tab can pay it back later now the reality is they might have to have to pay it back not financially but you know at some point they might well have to look after me so um kids if you listen to this in about 50 years time i remember right remember what i did for you a lot of nappies anyway but the point being the point being paul is saying actually i haven't charged my kids you're my kids i love you to bits 
I've pursued you. We've had 13 chapters of that. And what we have in chapters 12 and 13 is the climax. It's the finale. It's Paul um, preparing them for the point of his arrival. Look what he says in verse 14. Look at it again. Chapter 12, verse 14. Now I am ready to visit you for the third time. Chapter 13, verse 1. This will be my third visit to you. And finally, he is going to come. And the question is, what sort of shape will they be in? Where will they be with Jesus? Where will they be with lives that honor Jesus? And those are the two things that he finishes his letter on, saying, guys, if if there's anything you do in the light of the letter I've written to you, please do something about these two areas. Your lives following Christ and your trust in Christ. And so that's what we're launching into today. And I just think as he is coming in, um, there's a couple of aspects we're going to think about. And, and it, it's his pastoral heart for this church that he is calling out. And, and the first thing really he, he, we kind of find is this spiritual love he has as, as a dad, a spiritual dad. It's persevered through a lot of pain. That's the first point. It's persevered through a lot of pain. Uh, do you want to see it on the screen? There we go. There we go. Did it come up? No. Yes. It did. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just looking at my Bible, but well done. You can put it off now. It's not worth seeing, is it? But there you go. It's persevered through a lot of pain. Just have a look at verse 11. Right? Have a look at it. He says, I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. I ought to have been commended by you, for I am not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I am nothing. And I think we've got to hear the depth of emotion there in what he says in verse 11b. I ought to have been commended by you. But if you've been here over the past couple of weeks, you'll know that he has been, uh, Paul's been talking in a way that he describes as foolishness as he sort of presented his CV before them and said, look, I have suffered, I have been weak. And the reason he's gone on and on and on about that It says he's been forced to by this church. And the fact he's had to do that is incredibly painful because this church actually knows him. The fact he's had to defend himself, he shouldn't have had to do. You know, just think about Paul's relationship with this church. We've talked about it before, but it's just worth messaging again. Uh, You know, he planted this church. He turned up into Corinth. And there was no one there who was trusting Christ. And he preached Jesus in the synagogue, um, in the local markets, in the coffee shop where he's in Starbucks. And some of these people heard about Jesus and they responded to him. And so actually, what did Paul used to do? He'd go around their house, have a cup of tea. He helped counsel them when their marriages were going through rocky patches. Um, He baptized them. They went down to the local swimming pool. They booked it out for the afternoon. He baptized a whole bunch of them. They knew him. And yet, after years and hours of sweat and blood and tears and just care for them, when these super apostles came along with their they smelt great and their amazing teeth and their flash suits and their high expenses and they so quickly listened to them and they heard what they said you don't need to trust Paul you don't he doesn't love you anymore now he said I shouldn't have had to defend myself against that because the facts were plain it was just obvious Look what he says in verse 12. I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean, it's really interesting. When he goes off to boast, he could have just said this, remember the miracles. No one else does that. Remember the miracles. Obviously, he didn't because he was saying, I'm going to boast about my weakness because Christ's power rests on the weak. He could have done that. It's the trump card. Here he just drops it in. And it's just worth us clocking as we step back from the situation in Corinth. Um, if, if you're listening to someone on a podcast or an online preacher or there is someone in a church saying, I am an apostle, you need to listen to me, 
run a mile. Okay, you do not meet apostles like this today. Um, when he says, I had the true marks of an apostle, apostles are people who met the living Lord Jesus and were specifically commissioned by him to preach the gospel and lay the foundation of the faith. And so when Peter and Paul do miraculous signs, they do actually do some miraculous stuff in line with what Jesus did. Why? Because they have a unique authority to write these words on which our faith is built on. Um, once they all died, apostles died. They, they served the church. They did their work. So again, if someone comes to you and says, I'm an apostle, you need to listen to me, jump on your bike and go in the opposite direction. They're not today. That's a side point, right? But just clocky, he really was an apostle. And they knew it and they experienced it. And can you imagine the, the pain of having to go back to them again and again and again. These people who we feel, we probably would have felt quite betrayed. Now, I mean, I, I've got a friend of mine, uh, he's a minister, planted a church 15, 16 years in, just an accusation was made against him, um, which actually was unfair, has been proven to be untrue, but it was handled really, really poorly. It's been an incredibly painful experience for him. And he was talking to me about this. He says, it's like I've seen uh, this church, the, the, like these people have grown up from children and now they've hit the teenage years and they're blaming their dad for everything in their life. That's how he described it. That's painful, right? It's really painful. Can you imagine how hard it would be for Paul to swallow and swallow it all up and still keep coming back? and back in another letter and I'm coming to you I'm coming to you now how can he do that well it's not in the text right here but it's a bigger principle in the Bible yeah he is their spiritual father but how can he do that I think it's because he knows what it is to be pursued in a as someone who is truly undeserving by the relentless love of Christ you know, if you know what Paul's story, he was a bloke called Saul who was pursuing the church and wanted to kill Christians. He hated the church and Christ pursued him. He met him. He saved him. This, this, this guy who deserved death, he saved him. He forgave him all that was past. He rescued him from the judgment of hell. He put him on the road of, of knowing him and, and service and joy. How did he do that? Well, he knew the relentless pursuit of the love of Christ. And as someone who understood that, he pursued. He pursued this church. He kept on going, even though it was personally costly. Uh, I just want to say, um, maybe you are not a Christian here today, and you've been brought up in a Christian family and, um, and your parents keep nudging you to come to church or to do this. Do you know why they do that? It's because they love you to bits. Because they care for your souls. They love you more than you could ever imagine. And actually, it, it comes at a cost to them, but they want your best. Um, if you're a parent and you've been dragged through a whole host of pain by your kids, um, keep pursuing you know, it doesn't mean every time you see them, you bash them overhead with a Bible. But pray your socks off. Keep loving them. Keep pursuing them. Keep pursuing them. You've been pursued by Christ. Keep pursuing. And look, if you ever end up in, as being a pastor of a church or in church leadership, and that takes you through a whole host of pain, keep short accounts of sin. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Keep going back. Keep going to the cross. Keep going back. Love pursues even when it's painful that's been Paul that's what he's been doing in two, the whole of 2 Corinthians but the other thing we see I think in this section is that his love uh, won't leave people in a place of danger that's the second point his true love won't leave people in a place of danger and so there's a sense in which his love isn't just like oh it doesn't matter what's happened it's fine just come on it, there is some tough love here 
you know, there's a couple of really difficult issues he still will not let go of, and you just think, come on, Paul. I mean, look how he describes um, what he has been trying um, to do. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh. Let's go. Here we go. Verse, um, verse 19. Look how he describes himself. He says, look, have you, have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. He says, even the tough love, we do it because we love you and we want you to be strengthened. We want you to be established. We don't want you to be lost. And so he highlights two areas that he's really concerned for them before he arrives. Two things that make him afraid, or two areas. And look what he says in verse 20. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as, you want, as I want you to be. Verse 21. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you. You see, Paul is not some sociopath who loves conflict. He's not like, oh, I love a fight. I can't wait to get in there and, ah, oh, you know, they've been living for themselves and I'm going to show them one thing or two. Oh, man, he hates it. He hates it. But he loves them enough to say the difficult things. And so he says, look, lots of the way you behave it's like you're in the office at work. Look what he says in verse 20, or in, in the halls at university. I fear there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. It sounds like he's been watching an episode of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Right? Jealousy. Fits of rage. I mean, what is your workplace like? I imagine some of us are in workplaces are not all bad, but you must have experienced it. Oh, the chat at the water cooler, the gossip. I can't believe the boss did it again. The slander. Oh, that person over there, they're always doing this and they're always doing that. The selfish ambition, the arrogance, the disorder. Um, um, that is the world. And Paul says, please don't let that be the church. Please don't let that be the church. Guys, I know this has been a tendency, he says, to you in Corinth. Slander, gossip, jealousy, and it brings disunity. It brings great dishonor to Christ. You shouldn't be like the world. You need to repent. And look, we need to hear it, don't we? Like that juicy morsel that you just want to hear about that person from church, and then you want to pass it on. Oh, you can't believe what the elders did this time. No, 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 no. Whatever it may be. And maybe we, we, we indulge in that and we like it. And we may be part of that. And he says, deafen your ears. Repent of it. It just doesn't fit. And then he goes on in verse 21. Have a look. He said, I'm afraid that when I come to my God and he humble me before you, I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which you have indulged. And again, let's be clear here. He's um, uh, in his in 1 Corinthians, which is actually 2 Corinthians, if you've been around, you'll know that. Don't worry about it. Um, but um, clearly, this church had a problem around the issues of sexual morality. And one of them, some guy's been sleeping with his mother-in-law. It's been incest. And they're all celebrating, thinking it's a great thing. And he says, look, I'm, I'm fearing I'm coming, and you still haven't repented of that. Okay, you still haven't repented of the way you are given your God-given sexuality, which is for your good and for your flourishing in the right context between a man and a woman in the place of marriage. I'm, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to come and you're still celebrating and acting on stuff that you really shouldn't be and that I'm going to have to bring church discipline. Now look, um, so often we, we get our values, particularly our sexuality, from the world. Um, the Bible has a a very different view of this. Um, I don't know if, has, has anyone here got one of these cars? Okay, it is a Lamborghini. Now, I don't know what Lamborghini this is. Um, has anyone got a Lamborghini? Because if you do, can you take me out for a drive? <laughs> I'd like to go out in your Lamborghini. Uh, I imagine none of us have a Lamborghini. Um, but if you did have a Lamborghini, how many people would you go, 
hey, do you want to do you want to take this for a ride? Seriously, just take it out. Take it out for a little while. Um, I, none of us would. Why? Because you would not want. Well, someone went over there, but you're brave. Or even if you took someone out in your Lamborghini, you might be there. Do not bring your Starbucks coffee in here. If you spill that on the upholstery. No, um, a Lamborghini is something which would be incredibly precious that you'd only let some, you know, some very precious come and ride and come, come in. Um, but let's just say you didn't have a Lamborghini. Let's say you had one of these. A Robin Reliant. A Robin Reliant, a three-wheeler. Who would you let? You wouldn't care who came in the Robin Reliant. You'd give the keys to anyone. It's an absolute banger. Look at that. Oh, dear me. Look, our culture has demeaned our sexuality and they've made you believe it's a Robin Reliant. It doesn't matter who you let in it. I'll give it out to anyone. It just doesn't matter. Sleep with who you like. Look at pornography whenever you want to. And what you want to, re- what you want to realize, what society is done, they have cheapened something that God has given you as the most wonderful gift in the context of a marriage between a man and a woman that is glue. It's powerful glue for your good. It is a Lamborghini. And we've believed the lies. And we've ended up with a Robin Reliant. And it's tragic. And Paul loves this church enough to say, stop treating it like it's a Robin Reliant. It's not. It isn't. And for lots of you, he's saying, it may look like celibacy, and that's a brilliant thing. It's honoring a gift God gives for a certain purpose. He says, look, when I come, I don't want to have to lay the smack down on this. Repent. Sort it out. Look how he goes on, 13 verse 1. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Look, there's a quote there from Deuteronomy 19.15. It's in the Old Testament. It's about the issues of justice and in the law courts. If one person made an accusation against another person... Actually, you couldn't really take that seriously. You needed two or three people to bring uh, a testimony against someone. Why is that? It's to protect people against malicious accusations. It's to protect people, basically. Just in case you've got someone who's making a lie up about someone else, and they're a much better actor in the law court, and they get that person in a lot of trouble for something they haven't done. Uh, and Paul here is saying either, I've been a couple of times before and so there has been a couple more testimonies. I think more likely he's saying, when I come, there's going to be no personal vendetta against anyone. Genuinely, I'm just going to act in a way that is just trying to be safe and secure. I'm, I'm, I'm going to act in a way which is just and fair. But let me be clear with you. Verse 2, have a look. I already gave you warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it. And while absent on my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Um, he's saying... Actually, he will come in and act by not sparing them. It's not he's going to come in and have a massive scrap with them. But actually, he's, he's saying, look, there is a form of church discipline here. Uh, let me explain to you what we mean by that. When someone is professing, I know Jesus, I love and serve him, but they live in such a way that it just dishonors Jesus' name. It's clearly a going against what he is teaching. And if people have been warned again and again and again, and they refuse to repent, there is a point at which Paul here as he goes to Corinth, and actually the authority Paul has is the authority we have as a church given to us by Christ to say to someone, do you know what? Because we love you, we can't treat you as a Christian anymore. We're going to treat you like a tax collector. What does that mean? You can't take communion. That is is something that Christians do. We bar that off. Why is he willing to do that? Why is he willing to say, look, I'm going to have to come and enact this if you don't repent? Why? Well, because... He loves them because he wants them to be ready for the day when Christ returns. 
Now look, he's establishing his authority. Look, um, verse 3. Um, Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, weakness, yet when he lives by God's power, like nice, we live in him, yet by God's power we will live with him in our dealing um, with you. And let's be clear, what he's saying here um, is that Christ embraced our weakness. He died in our place on the cross, but he is no longer weak. He lives by the power of God. And in the same way, even though as an apostle, he says, I am weak, as I explain God's word, Christ himself will act in the power of God. So he's saying, look, I have authority. I love you as a spiritual dad, but Christ has given me spiritual authority to enact this. Uh, And so what is his goal in doing this? It is that they turn back and they come back to Christ. Look what he says, verse 10. Verse 9, he says, We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayers that you may be fully restored to Christ. Look, he says, verse 10, This is why I write these things when I'm absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for your building up and not for your tearing down. See, he loves them enough to be willing to enact some form of church discipline. Do you know, you can't profess Christ and live like that, and so we need to put you out of the church. But the goal is always to see people won back. Look at verse 5. If you like, he's talked about their living, but verse 5, he says, what are you believing? Verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Test yourselves. Are you still in the faith? Now, I guess doctors are always calling us, aren't they? They're always calling us. Examine yourself. Test yourself. Are there any lumps? There shouldn't be any bumps, places. Why? Because they want to catch a disease or an illness before it gets too soon. It gets too far down the line so they can treat it, um, so they can save a life. Paul says this is an even more important examination than that. It's the question of saying, am I today still trusting Christ as my only hope for the forgiveness of my sins? Um, Is his death my only hope? Is my confidence anywhere else? Is he my savior? Uh, We were up in Blackpool um, a few weeks ago. Uh, a few of us from the team, we were um, up there for an FIC leaders conference. And um, one night, um, outside the Blackpool Tower, there were five fire engines, there were 10 police cars, you kind of don't get, and there was a huge crowd of people, you get a little sense of it from this. There's big Blackpool Tower, there was that, and there's a huge crowd of people looking on, going, what is going on here? What is going on? And um, Ian, who's the brave one out of the church uh, staff team, he went and asked them. And do you know what was going on? A test. They were examining themselves. They were, they were testing to see if something happened, if an incident happened, if someone went up there and was, was going to do something silly or we had to evacuate people out of this building, we are testing ourselves to see whether we can get here quick enough to get people out, to rescue people and to do what our job is doing so that when the day comes, we are ready. We're testing ourselves. And Paul is saying, okay, test yourself for the day when I arrive But the only reason you're testing yourself for that day to make sure you're ready when Jesus Christ comes back. So the reality is all of us will meet Jesus. Uh, when, When he comes back to judge the living and the dead, we will all meet Jesus. And on that day, every thought, every act, Every deed will, be, deed will be laid plain before him. He will see you in all your goodness and the moments that you're like, yes, that was brilliant, and also in the moments that are just so ugly and gross and just depresses you. He sees it all. And on that day, he will divide every single person who has ever lived into a left and a right, into the sheep and the goats, And the goats will be judged 
for all eternity in the fires of hell. And his sheep will be rescued to be with him for all eternity. And on that day, there will be only one thing that matters. Whether Jesus is your savior. Whether he's forgiven you of your sins. And so Paul says, I want you to be ready for that day. And so I'm a dad, a spiritual dad with tough love. And so I'm asking you today, are you in him? I guess that's a question for all of us. You know, as we take communion, what are we doing? We are saying, am I trusting Christ? Is he my only hope? Is he the one who's forgiven me? It's my life. Am am I repenting of my sin and genuinely following him? There's no other hope. Examine yourself. Here is Paul. He loves this church. He loves them to bits. He's persevered with them, even when they've been rejecting him. He loves them enough not just to say, oh, big hug, but to challenge them. He cares for their eternal souls. I just want to say, how does it end with this church? How does it end? Just have a look at verse 11. What does he say? Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Rejoice. He's fully expectant. As as he turns up, the things will be all right. Then the history books tell us he spent about three months there. And do you know what he did in those three months? He wrote the book of Romans which has been kind of quite an important book for church. They really were restored. They were encouraged. They were of one mind. They lived in peace. This call of Paul was responded to by the Spirit of God, and they were restored. And I just want to say, I start off with that story of that dad and that daughter, and I just want to encourage you, that daughter who was in all that mess, she did come back. She came back. Uh, She passed the one test that matters. Her body had been so broken by the abuses of it, she only lasted another two or three years. But but I'll tell you what, she's safely home now. Why? Because she clung to Christ. Are you clinging to Christ? Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads. The band's going to come up. I'll just give you a few moments just to talk to the Lord in your heart. Maybe he's put something on you that you just think, I need to repent of that. Maybe you just need to say, look, am I really trusting Christ? Is he my hope in life and death? I'll just give you a few moments and then we'll sing a song that responds and looks to the cross in faith.